Hey everyone, this lesson is on athlete's foot. So in this lesson, we're gonna talk about what causes this condition. We're also gonna talk about some of the risk factors for getting this condition. We're also gonna talk about signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So athlete's foot is also known as tinea pedis. So tinea means a fungal skin infection and pedis means foot. You can think of words like pedicure. And it is an infection of the foot by fungi known as dermatophytes. And athlete's foot is the most common dermatophyte infection in adults. And we see that in children, the most common dermatophyte infection is ringworm or tinea corporis. If you want more information on that, please check out my lesson on that topic. Some of the causative organisms for athlete's foot are the following. Trichophyton rubrum is the most common causative organism with regards to athlete's foot. If you watch my other fungal skin infection lessons, you know that trichophyton rubrum can be a pest and it can actually cause many different fungal skin infections. And it's estimated that about 70% of cases of athlete's foot are caused by trichophyton rubrum. The other causative organisms in athlete's foot could be trichophyton interdigitale or epidermophyton flocosum. And these are the same organisms that cause jock itch or tinea cruris. And what we do find is that when we look at the genders, athlete's foot is more common in males than it is in females. What is the pathogenesis and what are some of the risk factors for athlete's foot? So the pathogenesis of this condition involves the following. So the fungi known as dermatophytes release digestive enzymes known as keratinases. And these keratinases enable the dermatophyte to penetrate into the epidermis. So the epidermis is made of keratin. So enzymes are the ases. Keratinases are enzymes that break down or penetrate into the keratin of the epidermis. Dermatophyte cell wall also contains what we call manins. And manins are compounds known to cause local immunosuppression. So these two pathological features are important in all dermatophytic skin infections like jock itch and ringworm. So dermatophytes' ability to digest and penetrate into the epidermis utilizing keratinases and their cell wall that contains manins allowing them to cause local immunosuppression. Both of these factors are very important in their pathogenesis. What are some of the risk factors for athlete's foot in general? One of them is a warm and humid environment. Another is shared facilities. So you may have heard of going and using communal pools or showers. These can increase your risk for getting athlete's foot. If someone else has this dermatophyte on their feet and they leave it in certain areas while they're walking and you walk over those areas, you may also become colonized and infected by these fungi as well. Excessive sweating is also an important risk factor as well. And we can also see chronic water or fluid exposure being a risk factor and chronic use of enclosed footwear. And these three risk factors here produce a warm and humid environment allowing the dermatophyte to grow. And in fact, chronic use of enclosed footwear is actually the most common risk factor for getting athlete's foot. We can also see individuals with genetic predispositions being at a higher risk of getting athlete's foot. So individuals with decreased beta defensins and certain systemic diseases like diabetes and certain cancers and immunosuppression from HIV or AIDS can increase your risk for getting infections in general, but also fungal skin infections like athlete's foot. So what does athlete's foot or tinea pedis look like? There are actually four different clinical variants of athlete's foot. The first one is intertriginous or interdigital tinea pedis. This is actually the most common presentation and it involves puritic erythematous scaly lesions in between the toes. That's where we get the name interdigital. So we see scaling between the toes. Most oftentimes, the lateral three toes are the most commonly affected. Another type of clinical presentation of tinea pedis is something we call hyperkeratotic tinea pedis. So hyperkeratotic tinea pedis affects the soles of the feet and it causes scaling and thickening of the soles of the feet. So when we look at the soles of the feet, we see hyperkeratosis, which is thickening of the skin. So hyperkeratosis really means, if you break it down, hyper means above or a lot. Carrot means or refers to the keratin in the skin and osis is an abnormal condition. So hyperkeratosis is an abnormal condition of a lot or high amounts of keratin. So it really means thickening of the skin. So we get scales and thickened skin on the soles of the feet with hyperkeratotic tinea pedis. The third clinical presentation of tinea pedis is vesiculobullous eruption or vesiculobullous tinea pedis. This is 
puritic, so it's itchy, but it has painful vesicles. Oftentimes we see the vesicles develop on the soles of the feet, and they can coalesce into larger bullae. And then in this image here, we can see ruptured vesicles on the soles of the feet. And oftentimes the medial foot, so the foot closer to the midline of the body, is more likely to be affected. And the fourth clinical presentation of tinnipedis is acute ulcerative, or acute ulcerative tinnipedis. And what we do find is that acute ulcerative tinnipedis is most commonly caused by trichophyton interdigitale, as opposed to the other types of tinnipedis, which are oftentimes or most commonly caused by trichophyton rubrum. What we do find is that we see erosions and ulcers, or ulceration, in between the toes. And we find that the third and fourth digits, or the third and fourth toes, are the commonly affected toes in this condition. So we can see here, there's interdigital ulceration. There's erosions and ulcerations. Interdigital just means that it's in between the toes. And we can also often see associated bacterial infections with this condition as well. So again, there are four clinical presentations of tinea pedis. The first one is intertriginous or interdigital. That is actually the most common clinical presentation of tinea pedis, and it involves scaling in between the toes. The second one is hyperkeratotic tinea pedis. That involves scaling and thickening of the skin on the soles of the feet. The third is vesiculobolus tinea pedis. This involves pruritic painful vesicles, oftentimes on the medial sole of the foot. And the fourth is acute ulcerative tinea pedis. This involves an infection with trichophyton interdigitale. It has erosions and ulcers between toes, and it can be associated with bacterial infections. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat athlete's foot? The diagnosis of athlete's foot is often a clinical diagnosis. We get the history from the patient, risk factors, signs and symptoms, and we look at the foot and see the skin lesion. This can often be enough to make the diagnosis. We could also do a potassium hydroxide or KOH wet mount, looking at skin scrapings. And once we have done the KOH wet mount, we look for segmented hyphae. And if we see those segmented hyphae, as we see here, these are segmented, that means that it is a tinea infection or a fungal skin infection. How do we treat it? So again, we want to modify risk factors. If you've watched my other lessons, it's all about modifying risk factors. So we've seen that the risk factors here are warm, humid environments, excessive sweating, chronic use of enclosed footwear, so shoes. Try to avoid all that. Try to keep your feet dry. Try to avoid wearing enclosed footwear for long periods of time. Try to avoid walking barefooted in certain areas like pools and showers that are often used in community settings. To actually treat athlete's foot, you want to use topical antifungals. The topical antifungals used for athlete's foot are slightly different. We again use the azoles, so drugs that have the suffix azole. We can also use butenafine, terbinafine, amylrolfine, or cyclopyrox. And again, topical nystatin is not effective with dermatophytic fungal skin infections. And if the topical antifungals don't work, we can move on and use oral antifungals like itraconazole. There's a special case or a special circumstance with regards to athlete's foot. Athlete's foot can often be associated with another type of fungal infection, and that is a fungal nail infection known as tinea unguum or onychomycosis. If you have tinea unguum or onychomycosis, you oftentimes need long periods of oral antifungals or long periods of topical antifungals specifically ifeniconazole or jublia for 48 weeks. So it's a long period of time, upwards of a year with regards to some of these topical treatments. So here is onychomycosis here. If you want more information on that topic, please check out my onychomycosis lesson. So again, to take away from the slide, oftentimes athlete's foot is a clinical diagnosis. We could do a KOH wet mount and we see segmented hyphae that gives us the diagnosis. Modifying risk factors is very important ensuring that you're not using enclosed footwear for very, very, very long periods of time, making sure that you keep your feet clean and dry. Topical antifungals are used to treat athlete's foot. If that doesn't work, we move on to oral antifungals. And it's important to always think about fungal nail infections like onychomycosis, because if you have onychomycosis, you're going to need long periods of oral antifungal or long periods of ifeniconazole, a topical antifungal. For more information, please check out my lessons on fungal skin infections, including onychomycosis, jock itch, and ringworm. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. 
And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.